Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Janice, and I am an alcoholic. And I am from the South in Kentucky, Tennessee, Southern Ohio. I love it. I'm from, uh, that's where I'm from and very proud of it. And last year, I, it's been a year since I spoke and I was here last year speaking and I was talking about how I moved here and all I seen and heard was people from Canada and Northern and I kept wondering where my Southern hospitality was and Roger happened to be here that night. So it made me real happy. Um, I love the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. There is no beginning or end to my love for the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's a design for living. And I was listening to Chuck C. last night, who I love. I adore. I have, I love the Fox Chuck C. old lead tapes. I listen to the old timers. Poor Boy Rice, poor, you know, all of them. Before there was a meeting where you could snap your fingers to go to every minute. And I listened to them and I could just cry because this program has given me a life that is humanly impossible to have. You know, uh, my sobriety date is October 16th, sweetest day, 1985. And I walked into the turning point that day. I was a walking, talking dead woman. I was a robot. I absolutely, there was nothing there. There was, I was so spiritually bankrupt, I didn't even know I was. I mean, I, I was just an empty shell. Everything, the drugs and the pills or anything I'd ever been using had just quit working. Nothing else worked for me. And you know what? Every humanly thing possible, I'm so grateful that I had tried everything humanly possible before I walked into the doors of that hospital because I didn't know I was coming to Alcoholics Anonymous. If I would have known I was coming to Alcoholics Anonymous, I'd probably be dead today. I went in that hospital simply because I had an addiction, I thought, to nerve pills in my hut, my hut, just everything driving me crazy. But after I was in there for about two weeks, a woman sitting next to me, she reached over and grabbed my arm, and I I told her, I said, Judy, they're talking about alcoholics in here. And she looked at me and she said, Janice, they've been, we've been going to meetings every day. We're in an alcohol treatment ward. <laughs> Let me tell you about denial. Denial. I went to meetings every day. They called me Hotsy Totsy. I walked in there with... Ten suitcases and had the men in the treatment center carrying my bags like bellboys. <laughs> I mean, I honestly, honestly was it. I had a plan. My plan was to go in that hospital, get off Valium, which I was taking, and go to Florida. I was just, that was my plan. Well, when she told me I was an alcoholic, and I kind of, the fog started lifting. It took two weeks. And my sobriety date on October 16th was the last day they gave me a Valium. Not the last day I took a drink of alcohol. Because they had to withdraw me. My hands curled. I went into DTs. I was severely withdrawing from alcohol. And when I, I felt like I was shell-shocked, like a prisoner of war. I was, I just, like a cat with its hands and its hair sticking up, you know, I was just, I was scared to death. What do I do without taking a drink of alcohol or drugs? And you know, in something about treatment centers, they put you in that hot seat or put you back in there when you're doing that to talk about your drugs and alcohol or your abuse of alcohol. And that, really helped me understand to bring me into the programs of Alcoholics Anonymous because I know today that nothing else works but this program. I drank. My parents were from Kentucky and Tennessee. I got married when I was 15. I've been married all my life. That's all I know. That's what we did. My mom came from a family of 16, 18 kids, and they all got married when they was real young. My dad was a city slicker from Tennessee, and that's what we did. I didn't know any other way of living but alcohol. 
That's what we did. We drank, work hard all week, drink on the weekends and party. You get drunk, you fight, you make up on Sunday night, and you go back to work Monday and you start over. I mean, it, nobody's really, you know, that's just the way it was. Alcohol was as much a breathing, uh, to me, as breathing. You know, if you got mad, sad, glad, scared, no matter what, that's what you did. You go get a drink. You know, you have a route. You go. I'm out of here. And that's all I knew. I didn't know another way to live. And I learned how to drink as a child from them. Mom and dad or my aunts and uncles or any friends or relatives that was there, I'd hear them when I was a little bitty kid wake up and they'd say, well, what'd we do last night? Well, I don't remember nothing. Well, I don't remember driving home. So by the time I got up 12 years old where I was drinking heavily on my own, I thought I was doing it the right way. That's what I heard them do. I didn't know there was anything wrong with me. I didn't know I had a problem. I thought that's what happened to you. And there wasn't one human being in my family going to tell you any different. <laughs> because if they said, boy, there's something wrong with drinking like that, Janice, then what they got to do? Look at their self. So there's no way. I, had, I didn't know any different. And uh, I drank. I, my mother gave me power gork. This is important when I was just a baby. I don't know if any of you remember that power gork. You could just get it from a drugstore, and it's a powerful drug. And then the rest of my life, from the time I was a little kid, they'd tell me, they'd say, we can't do a thing with her. Boy, they started me off. I think, you know, I was an alcoholic coming out of my mom, and as soon as she got a hold of me, she started giving me drugs. You know, I, and I, they never could do nothing with me. And by the time I was 12 years old and I'd found alcohol and I was drinking it freely on my own, blackout, first drink. I was a blackout drinker from the day one. I know I'm a type A alcoholic and game on. And it was my best friend. I don't have nothing against alcohol. It worked for me. It kept me going. It was my best friend. And that's why when I was in that treatment center and I came to, they threw me in a grief group. I grieved. <laughs> they sent me in there with a peach of people dying. They put me in a death group because I thought, how can I live without alcohol? That's all I knew how to do. It was just a natural part of my life. And I drank from age 12 till I got married when I was 15. And I, married, I came home, told my mom I had a boyfriend, and you got to get married. Girls your size, get married. I know what you're up to, so I got married. He's an older guy. He was an alcoholic. He was uh, very mean, very violent when I was a kid, and he beat me up, and I shot him. John like. <laughs> And you know what's funny is my great-grandma shot her up on Pine Mountain. She shot her husband, and my aunt shot her husband. It's a family tradition. <laughs> so I think I inherited that with this disease, too. <laughs> so I learned not to take no crap. I mean, yeah. And you know what? After years in this program, and I'll flip back to that hot seater later on when I got into the 12 steps of the Alcoholics Anonymous and learn it, look right down that fourth step and talking about Many years in this program, I looked pitiful. On paper, I looked really pitiful. You know, I could tell you a story and could rationalize, and that gave me plenty of reasons to get drunk over. You know, and on paper, I looked pitiful, but the truth is, I got in his face. And every woman in here know I want to get the last word. And I don't mean to preach and teach, and if I say you, I'm just talking about me, so I apologize right now. It's about me. But I'm going to get the last word, and I'm going to show you. I'm going to get in your face and then say, go, sit down, leave me alone, stop it. And you don't mess with an old mean drunk. Because at that time, I was just a little girl. I was just a girl. And he was like 20 years older than me. And he's a mean old drunk. Good looking, good looking. <laughs> but I would get in his face. And it took me five years in this program to see my part in it. To see my part where I could learn forgiveness so I could learn to live happy, joyous, and free in this body, in my mind, and have a life of my own. Because hating him, I was still living his life. I wasn't living my own life. I loved getting drunk on that anger the first five years of this program because I couldn't numb it up with alcohol. 
You know, I'd get mad or think about my past and I'd go get drunk. You know, and then for five, I got bleeding ulcers. But I want you to know that absolutely the most powerful thing I've ever seen in this world is those 12 steps. You know, it will set you free. After I divorced him, I finally, he, I was pronounced dead on arrival, had an out-of-body experience. <laughs> but he, he stabbed me and beat me and left me laying for dead. And uh, I was in a coma. When I got done, and he was drunk. I was drunk. It was all alcohol-related, every bit of it. And then I remarried again. That's what we do. And I got married again, and this man here was, uh, he's very, very, it was, he was a, into drugs. So drugs are part of my story. And it was very bad. There's no, nothing I can't tell you about heroin, and I've seen it all. I've seen it all. And there is a horrible way of living. But I can tell you this, there's not a drug addict that I haven't seen that didn't have a fifth of Jack on the table. Jack, the only reason I ever did drugs and out, did drugs was to give me some uh, relief from the alcohol. It gave me a break. Just like it says right here in the big book. In the big book it says, and then Bill Wilson says, and then you drink and drink and drink. Then you're off to see doctors and going to sanitariums and he may give you sedatives. And to me, every, every human I've ever seen that did drugs, including myself, it was just relief to keep me from drinking. Drinking, it, is what brought me down, not drugs. Alcohol is the most powerful thing I have ever seen that will take you down. And anyway, I, you know, that marriage broke up. I had a bit, I've, on my third marriage, I've been married 36 years. <laughs> and I just want you to know this man I married, he did not drink. I drank. We, he owned a bar, but he was a gambler. No, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> but anyway, what the whole time I was married to him, we drank and I drank. And every time I drank, I'd black out. I'd drink and black out. I tried to start taking Valium. I was taking pills to keep me from drinking, doing anything I possibly could to keep from taking that drink of alcohol. Now, mind you, I did not know that. I did not know that's what I was doing to keep me from drinking. I just thought my nerves were bad. I always rationalized and justified every drink I took or any pill I ever took. You know, I always had an excuse to drink. Because in my right mind, it's not rational to go get drunk. Why go get drunk all the time? It didn't make sense. Anyway, I drank, and I had five stepkids. We had 17 grandkids. I had plenty of reasons to drink and stay drunk and blackouts all the time, constantly. I, at the end, I would stop by a bar, and on my way home, I'd say I would join Christ Renews East Parish. I was a big in the church, and all my life I had been going to church back and forth. I'd went to Pentecostal church. I'd spoken tongues. I became a Catholic. I had been sprinkled. I love Catholic because you can drink. And I'd get drunk in the basement of that church and could not. All the other women there would just say, Janice, would you like a glass of wine? I'd drink one glass of wine, and I wouldn't get home till 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you know, it was so sad and so scary. Anyway, I came home. I voluntarily called a hospital up one day, and I said, I'm real sick. I need help. I called my doctor. He said, you've got to go to the hospital, Janice, to get off these pills. I'd never heard the word alcohol. They put me in the turning point, and like I said, I was in there all that time. And after two weeks of being in there, and I started coming to, they introduced me to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and then they started me on looking back at my past. And, you know, looking back at that wreckage, it's really hard. It's really hard even to accept that I was an alcoholic. Because when I went in that hospital, I was a big shot in the church. I was running a, I was a cheerleading advisor of a big Catholic school. I had a big, beautiful home. I had money. I had, I guess what you'd say, materially arrived. You know, how could I be an alcoholic? Why was I doing that, stopping at this bar and coming home? I wasn't in the gutter, but I was bringing the gutter home. And I heard that in an AA meeting, and it hit me like a ton of bricks, because you don't have to just be out laying in the gutter and everything. Your behavior and your attitude you bring home is, you might as well. 
because it destroys. This is a family disease. And what got me sitting there, I couldn't justify me being an alcoholic the way my life was today. Because to be an alcoholic, you were a dirty old woman. It was not a very pretty picture. You know, it was women that get a bad rap being an alcoholic. But I went back and looked over my life as a child, as a teenager. When I was 16 years old, they, I'd got in trouble. My husband, when we got drunk and fighting, threw me in jail. I fought the cops in the jail back in the 60s. They took you and put you in a mental institution. They took me, strapped me down in Sea Ward, and I had to go back and look at that, where I had just was laying there naked from head to toe, strapped down, drinking. I didn't know it then, but I know today that I had DTs, even back then. You know, this disease has boldly taken me where no human being should have to go. You know, I have suffered and desperately from it. Anyway, I got out of that hospital, and I started going to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, and that's what I want to talk about now is the recovery program. AA and the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous is what saved my life. I had to have a personality change sufficient to the recovery of alcoholism. And the only way I could have that personality change sufficient to the recovery of alcoholism is to believe I was, you can't fix something that's not broke. I had to admit to my innermost self that I was an alcoholic, you know, and that was the first step of recovery in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it says in there, we must concede to our innermost self. I am an alcoholic. You know, I'm powerless over alcohol and my life is unmanageable. And the second part of that first step says, my life's unmanageable. What is that? That's my alcoholism. I could accept that I had an alcohol problem, but I could not accept that I had the disease of alcoholism. There's a difference. And all I did was keep going back and forth in my mind. Am I an alcoholic? Am I not an alcoholic? But when I truly, truly accepted that I was an alcoholic, the rest of the story was easy here. I went to... uh, A lot of meetings. I want to tell you that this book right here is my textbook. The big book is my textbook. These meetings is my classroom. And the 12 and 12 is like a workbook. You know, and I believe that you have to get in these steps and work these steps if you're going to change. There's no other way. You know, it's like a cook with a cookbook. Just because you have a recipe doesn't mean you've cooked a meal. You've got to get in there and put the ingredients in, and you've got to do everything. It's like here in AA. You've got a formula. We have a design for living. We have a recipe here. And if you follow a few simple rules, a few simple rules, your life will get better and change. You know, and I realized that I did not have a drinking problem, that I just had nothing but a very serious thinking problem. You know, I could not keep blaming everybody and everything. Um, When I got to that second step and was talking about the God of my understanding, I absolutely could not accept having a God of my understanding in my life. When I was a kid, I had got molested trying to win a Bible. So I absolutely wanted no part of God or Jesus, even though I was going to church all the time. And I know I have a physical allergy of the body and obsession of the mind that I have to have a spiritual solution for. So I had to find a way to find God and love God. So in that second step, I opened my mind and I opened my heart and I was willing to try and get this program. You know, I had to talk about a God of my understanding. And the chapter to the agnostics on that second step, it says, we have fixed ideas, traditions, and superstitions. And that right there is what changed my life. When I read in there where it had fixed ideas, traditions, and superstitions, that's what I had. I had fixed ideas from my family. I had traditions that we just followed because you were supposed to. And I, you know, 
I knew I had to change, so I, that's what opened my mind and my heart to go ahead and start taking in this concept of God. Because in the book it says, first and foremost, we must quit playing God. And that's all I did was judge you, judge me, judge everybody. You know, my ego was in there, easing God out. All I ever wanted to do was judge every human being, people, places, and things. That's all I did. So how do you quit doing that? You know, you got to make a decision. And in that third step, I made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God. And turning my will and life over to the care of God, I had tried that. I tried doing that before. I've been, like I said, spoke in tongues. I've been to church. I did not know there was a difference between religion and spirituality. I had religion mixed up with spirituality. I didn't know the difference. Spirituality is where I let God love me. Religion is who I, where I love God. And I'm just speaking for me. This is what works for me. And I knew I had to have a spiritual solution for this physical allergy and of this obsession of the mind, or I was going to die. There was no way I could live. And I went to a, lot, a workshop, and I went to a lot of meetings, and I heard Father Leo talk, and he said, turning your will and your life over to the care of God is like turning your thinking and your feelings over. Turn them over. Change. Let it go. You know, turn that over and just start changing. And that's what I started doing. That's exactly what I started doing. And that process of this program in Alcoholics Anonymous is what started me on a new way of living, on a new way of thinking. You know, I was like, when I woke up in the, the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I looked like, I swear to God, I looked, I felt like I woke up in China, a black woman speaking Vietnamese. I <laughs> I had no idea of what you guys were talking about. I lived my life we, in that southern routine. This is what you do. This is how you think. This is what it is. There was no open-mindedness for anything. You know, and to be able to open my mind and my heart and try and find a new way of living. You know, I deserve it. I deserve to be happy, joyous, and free. I deserve a good life, not have this grip of this disease of alcoholism having a hold of me. You know, this disease, if you think it can't take you down or it can't go any lower, it can. You know, when I got here, I had, I tried everything not to drink. I didn't know that then. After I was in this program for a long time, that's when I found out. And I just working the steps and knowing in my heart that I absolutely am an alcoholic is what helped me. Working that four step, like I said early in the beginning when I said to you guys, I said, you know, on paper I look pitiful. And seeing what part I play in any situation is what gives me the freedom to live in this world freely. I don't care what's going on in my life. I don't care if it's a little situation, if it's a giant situation. I absolutely have to see what part I play in that. What part did I play in that? Because if I can see what part I played in that, then the rest of the problem doesn't belong to me. But my problem finding a fifth step was I was scared to death when I tried to work that fifth step that I'd go to hell, go to jail, you know, telling somebody all these secrets and everything. How do you do that? How do you go tell somebody everything? I was so terrified, and I got a sponsor, and we just did it. I talked, the words came out, and that opened up that freedom. And after I hit, and then I hit step six and seven. Step six is where I act. Step seven is where I react to situations. And those resentments and hatred and everything I had inside of me, this is where I quit reacting. And I know today for me to get a resentment, my rights have to move in. And the big book talks about your rights. 
You know, I get along and I'm staying sober for a long time and I start getting a little cocky and I think this or that. And then, you know, I'm doing this for you and I'm doing that, whether it's in service work, a meeting, at work, at home. And then I get to think of my rights move in and I should have you. You owe me this or you. That's why I get a resentment. It's when my rights move in. And I absolutely, if I can't do something for free and for fun, just like the program of Alcoholics Anonymous says, I shouldn't be doing it. Because for me to get a resentment, resentment is my number one offender, will kill me. Resentments will eat my lunch, eat my lunch, and I can't afford that. My number one enemy today is I forget that. You know, I forget everything I know. Knowledge will not keep me sober. I know a lot about this book, a lot about this program. But yesterday's bread won't feed me today. I work this program one day at a time, 24 hours a day. I've been down here in Florida now for six years, and when I got down here and decided to stay, I knew that I didn't know anybody. It was easy for me just to say, hey, I don't know anybody. I could have went on about my business. But I know this disease is constantly there with me, no matter what. And I found this home group here. I found this Monday night meeting. And thank God I did. You people, this is the best meeting I've ever been to. The excitement, the service work, everything that they offer in this meeting, this is the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. If you're sitting here and you feel like that you're not a part of it, come up and talk to one of us. Have fun with one of us. I'm telling you, we're all just a bunch of regular people. There's no, I used to sit back in that back. And I was sober for a long time and didn't want to join in. If you're new here, come up and talk to us and say hi and join in. Celebrate being sober. Celebrate not having to take a drink. You know, uh, steps six and seven, that's where I started growing up, becoming a mature woman, not a little robot, not a baby, not whining, not crying, accepting responsibility, taking care of me and mine and everything that I'm doing. Step eight and nine is becoming willing on step nine. Step nine is where I can look the world in the eye. You know, I get honest with me. I don't have to turn my head or be ashamed, not pick up that telephone when somebody calls, even when I was drinking or sober today. It feels so good to be able to look at anybody, shake their hand. If I say, tell you no, I don't want to do it, I can say no. I don't have to lie, make excuses. Do you know how good that feels? You know, just to be able to say what I want to say, be who I want to be, not pretend to be anything, not be a human doing, but be a human being. Not a walking, talking robot. You know, in step 10, I want, step 10 is where I call it my CPR step. Because when those thoughts hit my mind, like jealousy, or I don't like you, or I don't do this, or my rights move in, and I start getting an attitude, or start getting a resentment, and those thoughts come in, I gotta do something with them right then. If I, and I call it CPR, because if they hit my tongue, one word's too many, and a thousand's not enough. One word's too many and a thousand's not enough. You let my rights move in and you let me start getting a little bit angry and I start getting that juices flowing and you want to argue with me, game on. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, whoa. You know, it's just like the hawk or something coming up inside of me. I can't, you know, I can, I swell up. You know, and I swear to God, I honest to God do not want to do that, but I can't help it. I try not to. So when I, so that 10 step is like this. When I go like this, that's do the 10 step, Janice. Get on the telephone, call your sponsor, talk to somebody, get a pen and paper. For 18 years before I moved down here, I always had a pencil in my, back of my hair right here. And everybody asked me what it was. That was, grab that, I'd pick that pencil and paper up and sit down, and I'd rather take an ass whipping than write. But I'd rather pen to pen. (laughs) I think you guys know what I'm talking about. I mean, who wants to sit down and write this crap? You know, I'm Janice. I am, you know, I'm Janice, that big ego, that big cockiness. But I'd pull that pencil out and I'd say, I'm mad at that blah, 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 blah. And I'd start writing and then I could just throw it away. I didn't have to throw up on you. I didn't have to tell you what I thought. 
because I thought I knew everything. And until I hit step 11 and started seeking the God of my understanding and that humility and that passion and feeling the joy of this program and feeling alive in me, you know, ego is easing God out, easing God out. The book says, first and foremost, we must quit playing God. I can play God in a minute. I can play God in a minute. And that's what's going to kill me. That blocks the sunlight of the spirit that gives me the power. And lack of power is my dilemma. And I have got to have a power greater than me, a power greater than me, if I'm going to live freely, if I'm going to live. I know this all my life. There's been a longing in me. You know, and I filled that longing with alcohol. I'd get spiritus and I'd get happy. And they've, you've heard this before, you know, that spiritus is alcohol is of the spirit. You know, alcohol is a gift from God to gladden the hearts of men. There's nothing wrong with alcohol unless you're alcoholic. <laughs> the alcohol don't hurt nothing. You know, I see people, my dad, he can drink two or three beers. He's at my house right now. And he'll drink two or three beers, and I'll still just sit there and stare at him. He'll say, I'm going to have a beer and watch O'Reilly. And I'm like, my mom's sitting there, and I see her. She hasn't drank for years, real southern. She's 76 years old. She fell and cracked her spine. And I still see her mouth water and my palms sweat. (laughs) And he drinks one beer, and I've been sober 23 years. I am an alcoholic. I loved what alcohol did for me. But I'm going to tell you some good stuff, some drugs and booze or whatever. What's fun and for free is working that 11 step, finding a God of your understanding. They do not make a drug or a drink of alcohol, if you're alcoholic of my type, that feels like this program. When you work that 12 step and you're out there carrying the message or you're looking, and the closest I'll ever get to God right now, I'll tell you, is when I look another woman in the eye and I say, I understand. I can't get any closer to God than that because that's what I'm doing. That's what God wants me to do is carry this message. He wants me to say, you don't have to live like this anymore. You don't have to live like you're living anymore. There is a program of recovery that can help, that you can have a design for living and have everything your heart would ever desire. You know, where I come from and where I'm at today, you know, and I say this, I'm I'm just down here working. I work in my daughter's law because she is 12 years old when I came in this program. And if you think miracles can't happen, I wanted her to go to school, but I just couldn't get up and get her going. <laughs> I tried, you know, I mean, it was rough, (laughs) but my heart was there. I wanted to get her and help her do everything. I got sober in this program, and the women in the program would tell me, I'd say, they'd say, Janice, just go to these meetings, your daughter, let God take care of your daughter. I'd say, you're crazy. Janice, just go to these meetings. Don't worry about your husband and those kids. Don't worry about nothing. Just go to these meetings. And let me tell you something. What happens in this program is an absolute miracle. You know, my daughter went on to school. She went to Notre Dame. She uh, went to law school. That's how I got down here in Florida in Stetson, and she's an attorney in Tampa right now. I work in her law office. You know, and she knows, my family knows, there's not a human being knows that it's not as a direct result of me coming to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. So if you think miracles can happen one day at a time, all you got to do is get up, you know, follow a few simple rules like the big book says. There's a few simple rules we have to do and let the miracle happen for you. Let the miracle happen for you. I'm no better than you. You're no better than me. You know, we're all in this thing together and there is not one person. Nobody out there understands us but each other. You could talk to somebody that's not in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and they don't have the same. That's why we come to these meetings. You understand me, and I understand you. You know, all you have to do is want this program. All you have to do is want to be sober. You know, have you made that decision to do it? You know, I hope and pray for everybody in this room that you don't have to go where I went to get here. You know, I truly, truly do. 
because there is absolutely no beginning or end of what you can do. Read this book. Like I said, this is a textbook. Listen to the old timers in these meetings. They know. They've been there. They know what it's like to be sober. You know, and I'll tell you, I hear a lot of people talk about depression. You know, to me, depression today is self-obsession. You know, it me into me, I met my worst. Me out of me, I met my best. You know, if I sit around and just think about me, our little song, me, 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 you know, how depressed can that be? How isolated? You know, you're, you've got yourself trapped in your own mind and your body. You're not out there. You know, depression can be overcome. You know, not being self-obsessed. Quit thinking about yourself and go do service work. And I want to say this about that fifth step. You know, that fifth step, I did a fifth step and talked about it. And a few years later, I got with this group of people, and we were doing fifth steps all the time. I got a news flash for you. If you're working with other alcoholics, if you're working with wet drunks, and you're working with people, you can't help but do a fifth step. Because you look that woman in the eye or you look that person in the eye and you say, I understand. I know. And then what do you do? You tell them your story. That stuff comes up and it comes out of you and you get free. You unblock that junk in you. So doing a fifth step, you get it, you write it down, then go out and help others. Go do service work. If you want to get well, help others. That's how this thing works. You know, and... I do, Chuck C. says these two little stories. You know, if you're looking for God and you haven't found, if you can't find God, do you know why you can't find God? Anybody. Do you know why you can't find God? Because he ain't lost. He ain't lost. He ain't lost. He's right deep down inside of every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. Deep down inside of you, there is a space. The greatest scientist on the planet, no matter who, no matter what. I went back to college and became a counselor, and I did all kinds of stuff in this program. And there is one little missing thing. The greatest scientists, the theologians, no matter who on this planet, there is a missing longing for us. And for lack of a better word, they call it from our creator, where we came from. And that's our hope. That's our power. Seek to understand that. For me, I had to quit confusing religion and spirituality. I had to find out the difference. I have a spiritual malady. So, you know, seek and find that power within you. Seek and you will get better. Uh, the last little story I'm going to I just want to say this too, and I apologize for being so nervous. I had a rough day at work. I need to get my butt out and walk what I talk and do some more service work and talk more, and I wouldn't stutter around to daggone much. So I know what I need to do for me. Uh, in California, Chuck C. talks about the three little fishes swimming around in the ocean in Laguna Beach. And they were just swimming around in the water, and the water was fine and warm and everything. And this big fish come by, and he swam by, and he said, My, 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 isn't the water fine today? And the three little fishes looked at each other. You know, he swam off, and the three little fish looked at each other, and he said, What's water? You know, they kept saying, What's water? And what it is, is in which they lived and breathed and had their being. You know, God to me today is the air I breathe then I don't have to think about it. God, <laughs> you know, I told, and I just got a minute, but my husband, when I first got sober, my personal adventures before and after, I said I was going to this workshop to learn how to breathe. You know, I was wanting to read other books besides the big book. I was wanting to go to these other things outside of Alcoholics Anonymous, and everything I need is right here in this program. And I said, I'm going to this breathing workshop, and he said, well, how much does that cost? And I said, 150 bucks. And he said, I'll put a plastic bag over your head and teach you how to pray. <laughs> he, said, <laughs> he said, he said, you'll learn how to breathe and find God real quick. <laughs> and 
you know what? If I ever loosen up, I've got so many stories. I want you guys to know. I want you to celebrate this thing. You know, thank God that we're here with each other. And I love AA, and I love each and every one of you. And if you're new in this program, please, 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 our hats are off to you. But just know, by the grace of God, that we'll be here for you. We'll always be here for you because the reason I'm here is because I need you and you need me. We can't do this thing alone. I need you loving me and me loving you back. And I love all of you. Thank you for letting me share. (laughs) Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.